If the churches aren't doing that, then there's an issue. That's just, a, that's plain and simple. Um, also, we have an opportunity for some in here that would like to be involved in a prison ministry. Um, there's a ministry that uh, one of my brothers, a couple of my brothers, actually more than one, more than two probably, are involved in. And uh, they have an opening to go, in, go into the prison. And it's not through freeway, it's through a different ministry. But uh, but anyways, I want to ask if Brother EJ will come up here real quick and just uh, give, give a plug real fast for him. Uh, Matthew 9, 37 says, The harvest is plentiful, plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We have an awesome opportunity through Build Glass Ministries to go behind the walls. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's exciting for me to go to prison with a stamp on my hand and get to come out the same day. So there's a, it's, it's an awesome thing. Uh, I have a lot of information right here, uh, too much to cover right now, so if you guys are interested in this in any way, please get with uh, either Midnight right there, or myself uh, during the break, or immediately after. We got a lot of good stuff with dates and times and everything, so hopefully uh, some of you guys can come. Thank you. So why is 
It can be give up. All those things. Three reasons I thought Paul thought they would quit. Three reasons I came to. Three quick conclusions I came to uh, why Paul probably thought they would quit. Thought they would turn around. Thought they would give up. Listen to me. The first reason is this. Because of the persecution they witnessed Paul go through. It's easy to be a Christian when your friends aren't going to work to death in this group. It's easy to be a Christian when you're not going to jail for it. It's easy to be a Christian when, when you won't get shot for it. It's easy to be a Christian when ISIS isn't marking your house and come to take your wife and have bread and have sex with in front of you. It's easy here to be a Christian. Paul was thinking that they would, they would give up because of the persecution. Their leader was gone. Things were looking any better for Paul. And from the outside, he was doing really bad. The second reason is because, uh, because they might have to face that same persecution. They might be put in prison. Some of them might go to jail. Some of them might be killed. And it was a lot safer just to quit. The third reason is this. Some of you guys might not like this reason. I don't care. I think Paul wanted to give up sometimes. I think Paul wanted, wanted to quit sometimes. I think Paul got really discouraged sometimes. And I can prove it with my So Paul knew what it was like to be depressed. See, back then they didn't call it depression. But Paul knew what it was like. Paul knew what it was like to be alone. Paul knew what it was like to be discouraged. And so Paul is going to give and tell them what God showed him. The ability that God gave him to get through those times. And so tonight we're going to, we're going to dissect this prayer. And we're going to talk about how to come out of discouragement. We're going to talk about what God's going to do and, and the ability you can have to get out of that discouragement. Get out of that, that, that attitude of wanting to quit. Do you think Paul ever thought to himself, is it really worth it? Do you think Paul ever thought to himself, does anyone care how, how hard I work? Do you ever think Paul thought, this is too much. I can't keep going this way. I believe Paul dealt, Paul dealt with these issues at times in ministry, and I can show you scripture where he did. I believe Paul dealt with these issues, and Paul's a man just like you and me. Paul struggled just like you and me. The Bible does not say the men that wrote the Bible were inspired. Hold on. The, the Bible says that the Word of God is inspired. Let me tell you something. These men were not perfect. Don't try to quote me and say I'm a heretic. I'm, I'm telling you the Bible is 100% inspired front to back. I believe it's authenticity. I believe that it's 100% God's word, God breathed. But let me tell you something. The men that wrote it had problems. The men that wrote it had sin. The men that wrote it went through problems just like me and you. And so I believe in my heart that Paul went through these struggles and struggles you cannot imagine. And guess what? Even though he thought about quitting at times, Say, I don't think Paul ever wrestled with giving up. I don't think Paul ever was discouraged. Let me read you something Francis Schaeffer Branch, Francis Schaefer wrote. Listen to this, guys. Many times I say I cannot do it again. And what does God say? It is important to know that God does not scold a man when his tiredness comes from battle and his tears from his compassion. Let me say that again. God does not scold a man when his tiredness comes from battle and his tears come from compassion. Ministry is hard. I'm not talking about going to church on Sunday. I'm talking about 24 hours a day, frontline infantry in your face ministry, not airstrikes. I'm talking about in the dirt, in the trenches. That's where Paul was at. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Paul said this, From the Jews I received 40 stripes minus one. That's what they did to Jesus. Listen to me. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day in the deep. In journeys often. In perils and waters. That word peril means danger. In dangers and water. In dangers with rods. Robbers. In dangers of my own countrymen. In dangers. Gentile, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the wilderness, in dangers in the sea, in dangers among false brethren, in weariness, in toil, in sleepness, sleepy, sleeplessness, often, in hunger, in thirst, in fasting, in cold, in nakedness. Be 
besides all the other things that come upon me daily, my deep concern for the church. Are you telling me he never wanted to quit? Are you telling me he never had discouragement? Are you telling me that Paul never wanted to give up? That he felt the law? If you say yes, you're crazy. So how do we get out of that? How do we keep from suffering burnout? How do we keep from quitting on God? Paul's going to teach us that. Don't miss this. I believe that here in Scripture, Paul teaches us how God got him through hard times. I believe that Paul's prayers, his, his, the way he prayed, reflects what God did for him. He's, and, and he was close. I believe Paul was close to fainting. I believe close, Paul was close to turning back, giving up. I believe he wrestled with discouragement. And Paul's going to teach us how he got through it. See, what Paul prayed for that church was what God did for him. Paul prayed a prayer because God got him through those hard times and he asked God to get them through it the same way he got him through it. And I believe that from all my heart. There's, there's two prayers prayed in the book of Ephesians. The first prayer Paul prayed, I'm going to get into it in just a second. Paul prayed two prayers in the book of Ephesians. My question is, why did he pray two separate prayers? Why didn't he just pray one long prayer? He prayed two different prayers and for two different reasons. Listen to me. I think Paul penned the letter to let them know that he prayed two different ways for them. And we can learn a couple things from these prayers. The first prayer he prayed was in chapter 1, verse 15, starting to 21. Now listen. Paul prayed that they would get to understand the truth of God. That they would know the gospel. That they would receive wisdom from God. That they would receive knowledge from God. And that they would know who they were in Christ and how rich they were from being in Christ. That's the first prayer. Enlightenment. To know. To understand the truth. The second prayer is for enablement. Verse 16 says this. That you would be strengthened. Chapter 3 verse 16. That you would be strengthened. Verse 18. That you would be able. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do more than we ask you to think. Paul prayed the first time that they would understand the truth of God's word. That they would get a true glimpse of how rich they were in Christ just from being in Christ. And that truth that they learned, they would be able to use it. They would be able to apply it. They would be able to make an application in their life. My belief is Paul, Paul prayed that God would do for them what he did for Paul in tough times. In those seasons of doubt. In those seasons of discouragement. In those seasons of wanting to faint, to quit, to be burned. And this is hard. People get burned out. You check your kids up there and you walk away. But let me tell you something tonight. That's a tough job. That's a tough job. You ain't that food, but let me tell you something tonight. That's a tough job. It doesn't start today. They start cooking that food in the middle of the week. Sometimes in the month. It's a tough job. You go to the van, some of you. Guess what? That's a tough job. Sit my house down here by, by, by people who give up their Saturdays. We, they go in and they visit them on Saturdays early. People who don't have a visit, they go and visit them and work on them. That's a tough job. Listen, it's not easy. Security's a tough job. Guess what happens when it's freezing cold outside? Below zero, they're watching your cars in the freezing cold. It's a tough job. We set these chairs up. Going into the juvenile, faithful, three, three times a week. That's a tough job. Sometimes you want to quit. Sometimes you get discouraged. There's times that it happens. I don't care. It's true. Listen to me. First thing I want to tell you is this. You have to have supernatural strength. You have to have supernatural strength. If you do this ministry in the arm of your flesh, if you do this ministry in the arm of your flesh, you will fail. You will fail. You cannot do it in your own strength. Because it's all that you're doing in no spirit of God not involved. Paul said, I pray that you will be strengthened in the power of his might by his spirit. Let me explain that real quick. The first thing Paul mentions is true blue relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to be saved. First thing you need to ask yourself is, am I right with God? Am I a Christian? Uh, Paul prayed that God would provide power to overcome. But you cannot have a power from God without salvation. Listen to me. Paul said the first thing first is you better make sure you're right with God. You better make sure you're saved. I'm going to show you where. Look at verse 16 and 17. Chapter 3. That He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit 
in the inner man, inside of you, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul said before anything else, you better make sure you're right with God. First thing first, make sure you're saved. I wrote this down, it might make some of you mad. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Some of you need to be saved. You're not praying to God, you're praying to the ceiling. You're not right with God. You're not a Christian. You don't belong to Jesus Christ. Listen, you're not serving Him as a steward. You're not praying to Him as His child. You're not loving Him like you should. You think you're saved, but you're an enemy of God and a rebel shaking your fist at Him. The first thing you need to do is come to the altar and die before you can live. You need to be saved and give your heart to Jesus Christ first. You don't have the Spirit of God in you. You have no life change. There's no fruit. There's nothing coming out of you. I know something like that. Listen to what John Piper says. Assurance of salvation is a precious thing. So precious and so necessary that we dare not delude it with feelings of safety apart from a transformed life. Let me give that to you again. Assurance of salvation is a precious thing. So precious, so necessary that we dare not delude it with feelings of safety apart from a transformed life. You want to know how people are saved when you see them living for Jesus? Reading the same people read the Bibles. Same people share Christ. Same people love the Lord. Same people get involved. That's the gospel. Listen, don't be mad at me, be mad at Jesus. Overcoming. There are hard times that come. But the strength that comes from God only comes to believers. Believers. People who have been changed by God. You say, how do I know if I'm a believer? Jesus said, who's my family? Who's my brother? Who's my mother? Who's my father? Who's my sisters? Those who hear the word of God and do it. Safe people obey God. Safe people get sold out. Safe people get on to God and get on to Him. They don't let them go. I know I'm saved because my life's been changed dramatically by God. I have a different outlook. I'm not worried about pleasing people. I'm not worried about only getting high. I'm not worried about running streets. I'm not worried about some fix or some relationship or some promiscuous situation. I'll tell you right now, I don't care about anybody else and what they think about me as far as the way I look, the way I talk, the way I walk because I am saved. I've been touched by God. I know my relationship is real because I'm not the same as I used to be. the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is, who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You need to be saved. You need to be saved. You need to be right with God. The inner man. Paul says in verse 16, he talks about the inner man. Paul's prayer wasn't about anything on the outside. Paul's prayer was about things on the inside. See, inside of you, there's something called the heart. I'm not talking about what's beating in your chest. I'm talking about where your emotions sit. The pilot seat of your life, that's your heart. What, what decides what you like, what you don't like? It's your appetite for life. If uh, Star Trek Enterprise was a body, then Captain Kirk would be on the pilot seat. That would be the heart. And Paul said, uh, the inner man is what's important, what's inside of you. That's what Paul prayed about. Listen to me, guys. Paul was never concerned about external things. Paul was talking about internal things. This is the truth about salvation. Listen, you can look real good on the outside. You can go to church. You can know the hymns. You can sing along. You can wear suits. You can have your, your Bible, favorite study Bible by the most popular preacher. You can memorize scripture, the devil in the Bible. But that does not make you right with God. You know what makes you right with God? When you put Jesus Christ on the throne of your heart, you surrender to an almighty God. You say, use me, take me, I'm yours, everything I got is yours. I put my hands up, search me, take that jump for me. I'm yours, you're mine, I'm in you, you're in me. Let's go get them, Lord. That's a saved life. That's somebody who's saved. Listen to me. John 14, 23 says this. Jesus answered him and said this. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to Him. And we will make our home with Him. I'm not talking about sitting on your couch. I'm talking about you inside. The Father and the Son come and they make your home in you with the Holy Spirit. And they live in you. Listen, I remember when I got out of prison. Where's Tony Mar? Go in here. Lift your hand.
hand up here to Tony. Tony back there. There's Tony Armando. Say hi to Tony, guys. Hi, Tony. Tony Armando reminded me today. He was over my house. He was picking up a copy. And he said, man, come a long way. I remember when you got your first house and you had your first Christmas outside prison on Nickel Street. I used to live on Nickel Street. Nichols and Ford on the north side. Hey, I had a little house over there, man. It was, it was awesome. I loved it. I mean, uh, I, had, I lived next door to EJ. Um, I worked very hard for, 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 from the Harbor House. Started off my life in the Harbor House as the same Christian, right? Busted my backside, looking for work. Got a job, saved my money. I got a, I got a, uh, I had, got a custody of my, my little boy at the time. He was two and a half. I got this place to live. My first, my first two weeks, uh, I got a job my first two weeks at the Harbor House, and I worked like crazy, and I saved money, and I saved money, and I saved money, and I got home for this. And then I rented this house. It was on Nicholson Ford on the north side. Um, I was happy. I was happy to have my own place, man. Uh, Rick, my buddy Rick said, that's a bad neighborhood. I was like, man, I didn't know it. I was super excited, right? I got my own house. I got my place to live. I got my little boy's got his own bedroom, man. We're jamming out, right? I got a little backyard, playing the garden in it, man. I was living it up. Then I had an opportunity to run another place. It was a bigger place. It was a safer place. God blessed me with it. And I took advantage of that. I went and got that place. And then, and then uh, the Lord gave me an opportunity to buy, to buy a house. And I got a bigger family now. I'm married. And I have more kids. And uh, I was excited. And we went and we looked and we looked and we looked for a house and we found the right place. We found the right house. And I looked through all the rooms, guys. I went in every bedroom and I'm like, wow, look at this house! You know, put the closet open and, and look around and went in this room, look in this room, and went in this room, look in this room, and, and I'm looking through the house and I'm exploring the place and I'm like, man, this is my house. Can you believe that? High five. Woo! Right? Uh, no play in the room, you know? We're looking around, we're over the house, we're looking at the backyard, we're exploring the house, man, this is my house, my family, my wife, my kids, you know? Uh, look at the ceiling, that's awesome. You know what I'm saying? I'm, uh, I, I can go, I can do anything I want. I settled in. I moved the furniture in the house. I moved all my stuff in the house. My wife's stuff in the house. My kids' stuff in the house. I let them set their bedrooms up all they wanted. I put things where I wanted them to go. If you came over to my house today, I'll say this to you. Make yourself at home. But you know, that's a half truth. Because there's some things that you can't do in my house. You can't go through my things. Uh, you, you can't help yourself to everything you want. There's a sense of poverty when you visit somebody's house, right? You say, preacher, why are you telling me that? Because that's how you live your Christian life. You just invite Jesus over. He's just a guest. You never give him in your house. He doesn't have full reign. He can't do whatever he wants in your life. He's just a house guest. There's some things in your closet that you don't want Jesus to see. There's some things tucked under your bed that you're not willing to let go. He's not at home in your house. He's just somebody you invited over when you need help. When you don't need nothing from the church or nothing from God, some people, not only everybody, some people don't care about inviting Jesus over anymore. Only when you need a hand. Only when you're in a bad situation. Only when the lights go out. And I'm not talking about bills. I'm talking about period. In tough situations. Tragedy. Listen to me. He does not have free reign in your life. You're not willing to give him everything. How can he help you then? How can Jesus help you if you're not willing to give him everything? John 4, 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and I have overcome them. Because he's in you is greater than he who's in the world. Romans 8, 9. But you are not of the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed... The Spirit of God dwells in you. Jesus Christ is at home in my house. 
I live my life according to the gospel, speaking for myself. He can go wherever he wants. He can rearrange my life. He can put things anywhere he wants. I'm with him. I'm not just with him when things go wrong. I'm not just with him when people get sick. I'm not just with him when I need a help. I am always with him. He's in me. I'm in him. Listen, he doesn't have the, the co-pilot. Are you kidding me? Jesus Christ has the steering wheel of our life, and he directs where I go, and when I go my own way, I'm going to crash. See, looking for Jesus Christ is letting him have free reign. And hear me. You better make sure you've got things right with God on the inside before you worry about trying to get out of anything. We're going to take a 15 minute break.